สวัสดีครับ I've learned that so far <laughs> thank you very much um, so yes I'm here uh, basically to give you all an explanation as to you know what is it that we're working on in, in IBM right particularly to quantum computing um, so that basically the presentation I'm going to cover is in, in I'm going to try to put as much as I can in the short amount of time uh, but I want to be able to cover enough so that you get a you know, for those that have no idea what uh, quantum computing is, you'll understand it. And those that already have some experience with quantum, you can get an understanding as to what kind of research that's currently being done in the area of quantum computing. Um, so with that, we'll get started. So right now, with quantum computing, uh, we're, we're at the be we're, in a sense, just pretty much if you think of history, we're in the very beginning of a new era, right? It's, and it, it's taken a lot of years to get to this, right? So. Um, if you recall, in the, uh, in the 1940s, you know, the first computer was actually done back in the 1940s, and it was called Colossus, right? And this was, you know, this is the very beginning. They did a lot. Of, you can see it's a big room. It had a bunch of wires, cables, tubes. You know, this is before the transistor. So this is pretty much with the very beginning of the computers that we know today. Fast forward now to, to this century. Um, we're now here in the beginning of the quantum computer age now. So it's very similar in a sense, right? Large computer, it's in a big room, there's a lot of wires, cables, because it's a whole different technology, a different paradigm, right? So this is pretty much where we are. Right now we're a little bit more advanced. This, is, this was done a few years ago. So if you're kind of comparing it to history, we're about where the invention of the transistor is, right? Because we've moved on into, into more commercial, um, commercial systems. So a little history. Um, Quantum computing is quantum, rather quantum theory, quantum mechanics, it's, it's not new. It's been around for going on 100 years. This is a picture um, from a conference they had um, back in, in Belgium in 1929, I believe. Um, so they had, had a lot of people coming, and basically the discussion was on the physics, right? Quantum theory, what can we learn about the different quantum physics? And you can see there's a lot of famous people here. Um, or if you can see here, recognize Einstein, Mar Madame Curie, um, you have uh, Schrodinger, remember Schrodinger's cat, he didn't like cats, so. <laughs> um, it's Bohr, right? So you have a lot of, a lot of different, very, very popular people, or very intelligent people, I should say. Um, one interest, so the discussion here was about quantum mechanics, quantum physics, the strangeness of quantum, right? Because it was completely different at the time. Um, and one of the interesting things about this image is that of all the 29 people, 17 of them ended up either at this time or in the future in the winning Nobel Prizes. So you see there's a very, very, very intelligent people that met this early on. So this, in a sense, was sort of the beginning of what we now know as quantum mechanics, quantum physics. So there's a lot of history here. Like I mentioned, this is nothing new. But this is pretty much the beginnings of it. So now this is in the 20s. Fast forward. This here is now May of 1981. So IBM and MIT um, hosted a physics of computation conference. Um, and basically it was now, after learning a lot about the foundations, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, it's like, right now let's go into quantum information science. How can we now look about computing using, using the quantum pieces as a computational platform? So you can see there's a lot of famous people here, a lot of you know, very smart people, one of which is Richard Feynman. Very, 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 and, and as you mentioned earlier, there's somebody said if you want to do something with physics, if you want to be able to simulate um, uh, nature, you have to do it with quantum. And his, his person was, nature isn't classical, right? If you want to simulate nature, you got to make it quantum mechanical, right? It's, and it, this, is the, this is the part I like. It's a wonderful problem, but it's not easy. Because it is, you were talking about very subatomic levels, a lot of things that it's just not as simple to kind of comprehend, right? So this is one of the things that he mentioned. So what did he mean by that? So to compute certain things classically, you know, we know from classic computers, it's ones and zeros, right? On or off, true, false, et cetera, right? So everything is built on just those two states, right? But nature doesn't work in that pattern, right? It's not one and zeros. It's, a, it's basically a lot of different features. One, ex one example of this that I like to use is something that we can all relate to is caffeine. Right. We all know about caffeine. It's in your coffee, in your tea, pretty much everywhere. So to be able to represent, not model, but represent one molecule of caffeine, which you can see here, you'll need about 160 qubits. Qubits are quantum bits, right? So if I want to be able to just represent one molecule of caffeine, this is how many qubits I'll need. Does anybody want to take a guess as to how many bits it would take to represent one molecule of caffeine? Any guess? Well, you know. <laughs> So just to give you an idea, 10 to the power of 48. So to give you an idea as to what, how large that number is, that's about 1% of all the atoms on this planet, right? So clearly we cannot build a machine with that many bits, right? It's just impossible. And that's just for representing caffeine, right? So you look at things like penicillin, 
10 to the power 86. So it's a very, very large number of bits. So it's hard to be able to do that in that particular size. Right, right over here, we're getting into an extremely large number of uh, problems. So the problem here becomes we don't have enough resources to build these kind of machines. Right, so you can see, but of course, in qubits, for caffeine, 160, rather than 1086, we're going to need about 286 to be able to uh, represent a molecule of penicillin. So you can see the quantum, quantum bits, in a sense, of quantum computing pretty much has an, um, an advantage over scalability and available resources. So what do we mean by modeling? For example, you have a modeling of naphthalene. It requires about 116 qubits. Uh, for classical bits, 10 to the power of 34, it's still a lot of bits. To give you a comparison, in 2014, the total number of bits on the internet was 10 to the power of 25, right? So much more information, you know, and that's just to represent that one molecule, right? So, and to be able to represent it, I mean, you have a molecule like this, but then it's how do the particular um, atoms interact with each other, right? The energy states. So, when, to, to be able to say, okay, this is how it generates, now I understand how the molecule works. This is what I mean by mod representation. And then modeling then comes, okay, how does the caffeine react in a cup of coffee? So, if I drink a cup of coffee, well, you know, my heart rate goes up, I get a headache. So, how do I model that? How do I know, okay, don't put too much caffeine or do, you know, not too much sugar or something? So, to understand that, you need to know more than just that, right? So, that's where quantum kind of expands that. Now, you're looking at representing what Feynman says, in order to represent nature, it needs to be quantum because you have that ability, right? So, um, the, way, the way that works is the way it's sized is because for every qubit, you have two states. And just like in computers, you have state zero or one. Right? It's, it's one of the two states. Here with qubits, it's a combination of the two. So you can have, you can be in the zero um, point, you can be in one, and you can be in any combination between the two. Right? So and then A, B is basically the amount of, of, uh, that you're in the one state or the other. Right? And those are just generally complex terms. So for one qubit, you have two, two uh, state vectors, two basis states. For two qubits, you obviously expand that. So now you have four. Three qubits, you have eight. So what are we doing? We're doubling. So as opposed to a classic computer, if I have one million bits and I want to double the power of my classic computer, how many bits do I need? Another million bits, right? On a quantum computer, if I have 16 qubits and I want to double the power, I just need to add one more qubit. Because you get, every time you add a qubit, you're doubling the amount of processing power you have on it. All right, so this is a complex term with computers, classic computers are the power n, quantum is two to the power of n. So to give you an, exam an example here of the types of, um, once you start growing these qubits, you have, you can see two qubits gives you about the same as 512 bits. Uh, 16 goes to a megabyte, 35 goes into 512 gigabytes. But now once you get into the larger numbers, 100 qubit, 280 qubits, it's basically more atoms than there are in the planet, and then here more atoms than there are in the universe. So if I have a 500 qubit machine, I can definitely not replicate whatever I can do all that on a classic computer, it's just impossible. So, um, what are the potentials in this area now? So, we have, we obviously we can see we have a lot more resources now. We can do a lot more computations. We can do, we can learn a lot more now. But now it's a whole different way of thinking, right? It's, and, and there's a term that we use that we say we just don't think classically or stop thinking classically because from, we're familiar with zeros and ones and certain ways of doing things, but from a quantum perspective, it's a whole different paradigm, right? So, different algorithms, different way of thinking, right? So. There's a lot of potential in being able to identify what, what kind of problems can we solve that we don't even know we can solve because of the fact that now we can model certain molecules, we can expand certain things. So the potentials are in a sense are just wherever, they, wherever you want them to be, right? So we have a lot of work going into chemical and petroleum, for example. So we have chemical design or optimization in financial services, right? Risk assessments, targeting, portfolio management is a popular one. Um, life sciences, right, just drug discovery, if you can model certain medicines like penicillin, you can maybe make some ex expansions on that, molecular modeling, precision medicine, so personalized medicine, um, manufacturing, of course, processing, supply chain, and transportation logistics, right, for a good example here, just like in Miami, traffic is a big problem, right, so being able to understand and, and help with that is definitely something we can expand into here. So with, um, back in September 2017, uh, we published a paper in Nature, and basically that was to, in a sense, to identify the chemical potentials. What we did at that time was on a quantum computer, we uh, were able to calculate the energy state of two molecules, those hi two hydrogen molecules and a lithium hydrogen molecule. So we illustrated that saying, look here, we, sh we showed it a good example of using this particular experiment. Um, and then th th this month, earlier this month, we released another paper where we basically illustrated now the expansion, how you can have quantum um, advantage in a sense, on a small scale obviously, for uh, machine learning. Right? We were able to classify information using a quantum support vector 
that was able to produce a lot more, lot more uh, information for us. Right? So we're, there's a lot of advancement going on in these fields. So this, to me, is probably the most important slide I think you want to get an understanding of, particularly with all the press and all the information and everything you're reading on, on, on different things that are going on. It's where are we, right? You, you always hear people saying, oh, quantum computers are here, your encryption is going to break, and blah, 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 blah. Throw away your laptop because you can use a quantum computer. That's not the case, right? So um, the way we kind of look at it is on the roadmap, in a sense, there's three phases, or three eras, right? There's the quantum foundations, which was started back in the 1920s, right, from that first picture I showed you, where they, where they kind of developed the basics of quantum physics, quantum mechanics, which they started building up into quantum information science, right? And in 20, 2016, we got into what's called the quantum ready phase, which means we've got all the information on the foundation, we understand the technology, so we're now able to build a machine that pretty much does the quantum, that can calculate the quantum computer. So we launched it in 2016 on the cloud, so we made it obviously available for everybody. Um, and from that point, quantum ready meaning, all right, here's some machines, because they're early stage machines, right, they're what we call noisy intermediate scale quantum systems, they're not, you know, these big superpowers, right? They're, they're just five, we, for example, we have a five qubit machine, a 16 qubit machine, we have a fourth generation 20 qubit machine, right? But there isn't anything you can do on those machines that you can't do on a classical system, right? So we're not at this, this, this extreme phase, but we have enough access to them now that we can start learning, right? We want to get ready. Because when those machines get here, when we get to that particular phase, we want to be able to understand it. How do we compute things? How do we calculate it? How do we write algorithms? How do we scale it? Because if I write an algorithm that I can learn on, let's say on a 20 qubit machine, what happens in about you know, whatever number of years later when there's a 1 million qubit machine? How do I scale my, my application to my algorithm to be able to add, take advantage of those extra resources? Right? So it's a different way of thinking. So this particular quantum ready phase is where we are now. Right? Because they're noisy systems, we want to be able to increase quantum volume, which means reducing noise, increasing connectivity. We want to be able to you know, put some benchmarks in so it can be able to, to properly calculate with different types of machines. And basically, we're, we're, today we're right about here. Right? So what we want to eventually get to is this phase. This is what, they, what we refer to as the quantum advantage phase. What that generally means is we now prove, in particular, whatever the particular use case is, that I can do something, I can solve a problem on a quantum computer that's impossible to solve on a classic computer, right? Whether that's to model a particular molecule or penicillin or whatever the particular use case is, right? This, of course, will vary, as you can see the dots, because if I have a problem and I only require 100 qubits, then I can say I've hit quantum advantage. But if somebody's working on something more complex, like, you know, weather prediction or something, then it might take a little bit more qubits, perhaps, right? So there isn't a specific time saying, okay, 200 qubits is it. No, we don't know, because it's not until you get to a certain point. Like I mentioned, the computers we have now, the, the, the quantum computers we have now, they're 5, 16 qubits. They're not any powerful than a classic computer, right? Particularly like high-performance computing and these kind of things, right? So, but we eventually, this is what we want to get to. We're working our way now to get to this quantum advantage so that we can do this. We can enable scientific discovery at this point. We can get some commercial value with different companies and be able to demonstrate that we're able to move forward. So generally, like I mentioned, the, um, the difference between a bit and a qubit, as you can see here, is just generally just what you see here. Um, on a classic bit, it's zero and one. So you can see here on the top, north pole is zero, on the bottom, south pole is one. But with quantum computing, I can have a combination of both. So it's not just you know, somewhere in between, but also phases. Right? So you can see there's a theta, which pretty much gives me the angle between the two, and then a phase where I can kind of swing it around. So I can pretty much gives me almost a three-dimensional operation on this particular qubit. Right? And here you can see kind of a, a, a hardware design of one of the qubit processor chips we have. Um, and because we can have this superposition, which is basically a combination of zero and one, that's what we have. Right? That's, a, that's, the, that's the extra power that we have with the quantum computers. So for a quantum computer to work, ideally, we're generally using two of quantum mechanical principles, right? The first one I mentioned is superposition. It's being able to have one or two qubits, I mean, one or two states, combination of one or two states. But the problem here is, if you, if you're, for those of you that are familiar with, um, with uh, you know, quantum mechanics, is that once you take a measurement, you collapse, right? You collapse, it becomes, wherever it is, it's going to collapse either zero or one. And then you take a measurement, it's done. As soon as you do that, you lose all the information about that particular qubit, right? So ideally, that doesn't make sense. I mean, it's not helpful by itself because if you take a measurement, then I can't continue using the qubit. So that's where we start looking into the second principle, which is entanglement. So entanglement means I have two or more qubits that are entangled, meaning the properties on this one is the exact same one on this one. So if I, if I take a measurement on this one and I measure it to be zero, I know that this one is going to measure to zero when I measure because they're entangled, right? So you can see here they're kind of connected. 
And what that allows me to do is I can take a measurement on one qubit, see what, determine what it is, and then use the other qubit and continue some operation. And if I need to um, entangle that with another qubit to do something different, I can continue doing it. And I keep going down now following this process. So this way I can still take advantage of all the phases, yet not collapse it all the time. Right, so these are the two main features, and this is what the advantages we have over um, classic computers. So superposition and entanglement. So one of the things, at least the questions I always get, and some people always ask, all right, how many qubits do I need to, to, to do something? Or how many qubits is enough to build, to surpass a classic computer? Right, so uh, the reality is with, classic, with quantum computers, it's not, in classic computers, it's bits, right? More bits, more processing power. In quantum, it's quantum volume. Right? And that's basically a combination of, of five different features. One of them is, yes, the number of physical qubits, right? The other one is connectivity between the qubits. So remember I mentioned we have superposition and entanglement. But if I have 200 qubits and only qubit one is connected to two, two to three, three to four, then I only have a certain number of entanglement. But if all qubits are connected together, then I have various different ways I can, I can entangle, right? So the connectivity is important, right? How much connectivity do I have? The available hardware gate set. How many operations can I perform on this particular qubit, right? Um, the more, one of the more important ones now, which is why we're, we're in this noisy intermediate scale systems, is this error and decoherence of gates. Meaning how many operations can I get on a qubit before it starts getting too much interference, right? Because as you know, as it, with, a, with a qubit, it, you know, we, we initialize it to initial state of zero, but eventually it wants to be able to get back to that excited state. So you can only make, and every time you make an operation or even when you take a measurement, you're introducing some kind of noise or interference, right? And because of that, as the more operations I do, the more um, decoherence I, I start getting into, right? so I get more noisy, so I start losing information. So being able to minimize the error rate is very important. Um, so for, I have, for example, we have here, on the x gate we have uh, qubits, and on the, y, and on, the x, on the x axis and on the y axis, we have the error rate, right? So um, you can see we have qubits 5, 15, 50, 100, and then going up, we have very high error rate, 0.01, and then very low, 0 0.0001, right? So what this means is, as you can see from here as an example, if I have 50 qubits, machine with 50 qubits, and I have very high error rate, right? So the amount of qubits there doesn't really matter. You can you see it's not much of a difference between, very little difference between a five and a 50. And if I add, if I double it, if I have 50 more qubits in there, there's not much of a difference. Why? Because if I have very high error, I can't do too many operations on it, right? I can only maybe get 50 microseconds or 60 microseconds before I start getting decoherence, before coherence starts to get noisy. So it doesn't matter how many qubits you have, because if I only have to do a certain amount of, I only have a certain time before it starts getting noisy, it doesn't matter how many I go to death, right? So, but if you notice, if we improve the error by 10 times, we get, we get a lot more done. Why? Because I can perform more operations. I can have more connectivity, right? If I have more connectivity between, between the, the, the other qubits, et cetera. So you can see that by just fixing up the error, I don't have to double my qubits. I can do a lot more operations on the same number of qubits than I can if I just increase it and not increase the error. Obviously, that continues to grow. And as you get higher, you get lower error rates. You get, you get a lot more computation power, right? And it's quantum volume, right? So quantum volume is, in a sense, what you want to be able to, to say, OK, is this powerful? So when you see somebody saying we have a you know, 100 qubit chip or something, that's fine, but then you, you want to ask the questions. Okay, how many, you know, how are they connected? You know, what's the decoherence? What's the coherence time, right? These are all things you have to ask because again, I could have 500 qubits, but with my five qubit machine, it's, what's the difference, right? There's not much of, that's how much computing power you can make. So quantum volume is very important to understand. Um, so here's just a quick number of more or less what you can kind of do with a certain number of qubits. Um, this is, of course, just to take with a grain of salt. It's not exact. But for quantum chemistry, some problems you can get advantage of around between 100 to 1,000. Um, optimization, about the same. But when you start getting to these larger ones, the big linear algebra problems, you probably need something in the millions of qubits right? because of just the complexity of those kind of problems. So what's in a quantum computer? Right? So we talked a little bit about just the basics. So now the inside of the quantum computer. So this right here is our latest um, um, computer we have set up now. It's, uh, we, we announced it back in January, I believe, at um, CES. It's the IBM Q System 1. So what it is, is basically the first commercially integrated system. Meaning, before this is all in the lab, a big room like this, and we had the dilution chamber there, the, the systems here, the computers there, et cetera. So now we put everything together into one big block. It's pretty big. It's about nine feet by nine feet um, large. But it, it, in house, it encases everything. And it's built in a way to be able to suppress a lot of things, right? So it's on a raised platform to eliminate any kind of vibration or thermal heat. Um, 
The glass itself is to be able to withstand noise, makes it airtight so that there's no interference in there. Um, you can see all the cooling systems to be able to cool this because we have to cool this down very, very cold to 15 millikelvin. So that's all built in. And all of these things are basically the systems that connect to the cloud. So you basically from your computer down here and converts them to pulses, which is what we use to be able to send information down to the system. Um, here you can see sort of a, a layout of our chips, quantum chips. This is a processor it sits on. And this is a dilution chamber. So this thing looks like a chandelier in the middle, that big tank. That's basically just what we use to cool down the, the qubit. Because in order to start an initial state, we got to bring it to almost absolute zero. So it comes down in phases. You can see it's sort of around 40 Kelvin, then 3 Kelvin, 0 0.9, 0 0.1. And right down where the qubit is, that actually drops down to 15 millikelvin. To give you an idea, that's 10 times colder than space. Just kind of give you an idea how cold that gets. But we need to bring it down to cold to be able to bring that, bring that, um, that uh, qubit down to the initial state. So at that point, how it generally works is you have users that are either developing or they're sending applications. That goes into the Qiskit system. It goes into a classic computer, which basically interprets the system here and then sends the information through these pulses. And these pulse racks send pulses down to a connector and then goes on some coax filters, attenuators, goes to the quantum processor, performs the operation, and then reads out the information back, shoots it into amplifiers, brings it back, and gives you back your result. So it's just a quick in and out. Um, so generally here, the information comes in classically, right? But once you go in through here, because we have, because of the qubit has multiple states, we have two to the end different paths that it can go to, right? So you have superposition at this point. Then we take a measurement, collapses back down to classical, and then that comes out as classical bits as your response. So to, to get, kind of get started, as soon as we released it, um, the Kong computer on 216, 2016, um, the idea was we made it open. In a sense, we, we, you know, we could have locked ourselves in a room, put a lot of PhDs in there, and just say, we're going to work on it. We'll display it when we're ready. But what the problem with that is, if you think about it, history, we had, you know, with computers back in the 40s, you had to go there, you had to schedule time and go in and stuff, so that it slowed down the progress. But now, obviously, with the advent of the internet and cloud, we figure, well, if you make everything open source, put everything out there, and just have people work on it, you, we, we are able to advance that technology, right? We can build an ecosystem of developers, researchers that really get this technology going, right? So that's, just, that's one of the reasons why we came up with the IBM Q experience, which is just that. It's a cloud that allows you to learn. So if you're, not, if you're completely new to it, you can come up here and it gives you a lot of tutorials. You can create your own circuit, run your own experiments. Um, then we also have a software um, kit, development kit that we call Qiskit. It's short for Quantum Information Science Kit. So this you download and it integrates with your Jupyter Notebook. We just released uh, one that's for JavaScript now. So you can actually put it into JavaScript code if you want. But generally you could use this and you could code this to a five qubit machine, a 16 qubit machine. Again, it's free. You log on, you register, you get an API token, you push it, register here, and you're ready to go. Right? You can start running your own computations and do your own research. Uh, with Qiskit, we have different levels. right? So there's a hardware in, the, in Qiskit itself, which is built on top of it. Terra is the part that's just basically for being able to compute the qubits. If I want to write these specific algorithms, I can do this here. With Aqua, it's basically what's built on top of it. So this is, for example, I have a researcher that's an AI, a researcher in chemistry, et cetera. They don't want to learn, they don't have to learn how to create a program a qubit. They don't have to do, they just want to do their experiment, right? They just want to use a computer. If there's an algorithm that they need, they want to pass their data, run the computation, bring it back. So Aqua allows developers to create an algorithm. So if you have an idea for an algorithm, you can put it on here. You can have people try it, they'll use it, and then they'll just use your algorithm and return a response. So Aqua is built on top of those pieces. Um, the other thing we also do is we're very transparent as far as all the information we give you, and particularly even the hardware. So when you go there for each machine, you can see the configurations, right? So you see pretty much the layout and then the logical layout of the qubits, right? So the qubits, as I mentioned, here's the entanglement, right? So you can see qubit 0 and 1 are connected, 2 and 0, 2 and 3, 2 and 4, right? But notice that there's some that aren't connected, right? Two, 0 and 4, 1 and 3, 1 and 4. So this is what I meant by the more connectivity, the better. But the reason we're not trying to do too much connectivity is because you also want to make sure that it's clean, right? Because if I send a pulse to two, I might get a little bit of noise that's going to leak out into some of these other ones and hence introduce some errors, right? So again, this is why we want to make sure that we have good, clean error, um, um, or, or very good clean um, systems. So we want to be able to work with that. And one thing we also, when we calibrate it pretty much every day. So every time you go in, you log on, you'll see exactly when it was last calibrated. And then at the same time we calibrate, we calibrate, we give you the information on each qubit. So this is a five qubit machine. So you can see here is each five qubit. You get information on what frequency is being used. 
what the T1 and T2 time is, the decoherence time for each qubit, the gate errors, the readout errors, meaning what can I get back, multi-gate errors, if you're doing control knots, um, those kind of things. So you get all that information right here. So by looking at this, you can see that if you have a, a qubit with very low T2 time, you don't, want to run a, you don't want to run a long operation here. You want to look at the larger one, right, 48 or 46, and run those for the long operations. Um, and Aqua and some of these things automatically check that for you. So if they see something that you're going to run long, it'll know to run it on a particular different uh, uh, qubit. So one of the things also is, um, you hear a lot of things about, well, so, so do I have to mean, does that mean I got to throw away my computer that I had now, my big server, my big processor system that I have? Um, the reality is no, right? Because quantum computers are not going to be used for everything, right? I'm not going to use a quantum computer to check my email. I'm not going to use it to watch Netflix, right? So it's not, I'm going to use it for heavy computation, right? Uh, there's no reason why I can't just keep using my system. So the idea is to be able to do something and just make it as a hybrid, right? So you get your classic systems. For example, this one is from modeling lithium hydrogen, right? So you set up a molecule, you can measure energy wave function, and then you send that information down to the quantum computer to calculate some pieces. You get the, and you can iterate as much as you want, right? If you want to do some, you're going through a loop, but you want different data, you can run those pieces off. And once it's done, it brings you back, and then you do some post-processing. And the idea for this mainly is because, you know, scientists and researchers, particularly in these areas like material science or artificial intelligence, they have their systems, their packages, their toolkits that they use. There's no reason to tell all those things, all right, everybody's got to go to quantum. No. We integrate within these systems, like by a KISS kit, so that you can still keep using those systems, and then just call using like one or two lines of code, using KISS kit to call and pass your data there, prepare it, get it in, get the calculations done, come back, and then continue your processing, right? So that's, that's basically, in a sense, how we want to make sure that you understand that it's not, you know, we're replacing everything, but you're actually going to have a quantum computer that's going to integrate with your system. Right? So the different types of experiments we've done, uh, we have over 100,000 of users. Oh. Hello. Um, 100,000 users, we're literally working in all, different, all seven continents, including Antarctica. There was actually a researcher in Antarctica who used it. Um, we have over 6 million experiments. You can see the different colors. Those are the different experiments that are done on a uh, 5 qubit and a 16 qubit machine. And uh, we've actually, this is old numbers. I think we're over 150 ex external papers. These are outside of IBM uh, research team. <coughs> so there are different types of research, particularly that. Um, you can see a lot of different research we have on machine learning. Uh, chemistry is an another one we go through. Optimization challenges, risk analysis for like the financial districts and, and, and things. So, you know, I think we do. Carlos simulation, we showed that there's quantum. And then here, the Q network, this is basically, at this point, you say, all right, I understand it, I've tried it out, now how do I, how do I, how do I work with you guys? Because it's pretty much what, what you want to do. So the quantum Q network, um, their main mission is these three pieces. Number one, obviously, is to accelerate the quantum research. We don't want to keep it, we want to keep it going. Whether it's hardware or software, you know, that's why we have a nice full stack that we want to be able to continue contributing and then have others contribute as well. Um, develop commercial applications. We have a lot of partners that come to us, or universities that say we want to be able to get an understanding of it so that we get quantum ready. We understand so when these machines get here, we can start implementing and putting in nice research papers. And of course, promote and edu educate and prepare. And that's probably the most important part here because of the fact that as you've, if some of you who have been programming this, you understand that it's a completely different way of, of thinking, right? Again, you don't want to think classically because you get questions of how do you represent this and this? And people are, that's the, first art, that's the first obstacle that's always tough to get through, is, is, is to kind of get the classical thinking out. So um, by looking at these particular pieces, this helps advance those particular um, projects, right? Um, here's an example of some of the networks that we're, um, different networks that we work with. They all have different types, right? So hubs generally are just basically these centers, or like extensions of, the, of, um, of IBM Q. So you can see we're different universities, Oxford, North Carolina State, Keio University, which you mentioned earlier here out of Japan. Um, partners, so these are um, companies that we work for directly, meaning they have a particular use case or use cases that they want to try to work on and, and develop. Um, so we have Daimler, for example, they're looking at optimizing um, um, vehicle manufacturing, uh, Morgan Stanley Chase, optimization in finance, um, Accenture, Exxon Mobil, looking at energy. Academics, so these are ways of teaching quantum computing to prepare them. So you have University of Minho in, up in Portugal, uh, CERN, uh, Taiwan. So different universities are working. Of course, online education as well, edX. Uh, members, these are just folks that want to kind of get in. So Fermilab, um, Mitsubishi, Barclays, and of course, even startups. Right? So a lot of people, they want to start their own company. They have 
it's an idea. So they have a lot of different startups that we work with. Again, this is just to promote education and to kind of help develop the research. So if they're coming up with something, a better way to cool a chip or they're coming up with an algorithm, of course, you want to make sure that they contribute so that they become, you know, the, the, uh, the education can grow. So these partners and, and hubs and academics, they work with our core group because obviously there aren't a lot of us around, right? So that's why they have, for example, this about myself as a quantum ambassador because we send out to kind of give you the information, all these things to get started. But if you feel, all right, I want to find out what the next step is, then the Q network is kind of where to go because, you know, each one obviously has a different mission, different path. So it just varies as to what, how, you know, what you want to work on with these. Um, so the different it works that they, the different use cases that I kind of work with so far, uh, simulation, right, quantum chemistry, material science, high energy physics. So this is stuff we're working with CERN, for example. Um, they want to be able to use quantum computing in part of their Large Hadron Collider. And I think they're expanding it now from the 27 kilometer one to the 100 kilometer and building a larger one. Um, the artificial intelligence, right, better modeling, training, pattern recognition, fraud detection. Um, and optimization, Monte Carlo, right, so these are more finance, portfolio optimization, risk analysis, et cetera. Um, and this is just a little bit more details as to the, how you can kind of engage. Um, hubs are generally are regional centers. They do a lot of R&D and education, so most of them are universities. And they kind of work in a sense to say, I want to you know, have a university. They, they're more of the centralized hub, so they can go on with actual access grants, look for different projects, et cetera. ExxonMobil, um, they just recently here in January, they signed on, they want to basically work on and being the first energy, first, they are the first energy company to join IBM Q Network. And they would generally want to go in and look at different ways of either manufacturing or energy sciences. And this is just some um, feedback we got from some of the folks. So Kyoido, the dean from um, Chaos, has basically enabling, was able to extend their members and a lot of their education to be able to teach this, these pre Because one of the things also is that, how do you teach quantum computing in a sense? So now you have access to machines, et cetera. So there's hardware and software as far as that. Um, and the vice president of ExxonMobil, again, um, says that, is a, the, again, the potential is there, right? Because we're not there with, as far as the hardware, but the potential, potential is there, meaning let's start thinking about those problems because there's going to be a phase, a point in, in this time where we're going to find that we're going to have big machines and we're going to end up learning that there's some problems that we never even thought about, right? If you can think about the classic computers in the 40s, they weren't thinking about video streaming because they didn't even invent the TV yet. Like TV wasn't invented down to the 50s, right? So, so there's, there's lots of things that could come up out of, out of this um, moving forward. So generally kind of a roadmap. Right in the beginning, we, we released it to, um, 2016, our five qubit machine. 2018, we had the 16. And 2019 is this new one we have here, our quantum system one, right? So this is, like you see, this was done in the lab, and this is where we came out into integration pieces. Uh, I'm sorry, commercially integrated systems. So the system one, um, so right now all the machines, all the quantum computers are actually in, in, uh, in uh, New York, in the um, Yorktown Heights Research Lab, except for one which is in Zurich. We have one system that's in the research lab in Zurich. But all I said, but now these, the new ones that we're going to come out, we're actually going to put them into our um, computation center, which is going to be down in Poughkeepsie, New York. And that's a larger facility because they have a lot of people there to have experience on maintaining and making sure that these kind of systems are up and running. And of course, a research lab is just getting too big, right? So they're going to start building those in there. And of course, by having it there in a computation center, because they're commercially available, it's not like, it's not like you can buy one and take it home, right? It's more of you have access to it, right? So if, you want, if you're a startup and you have, you have a chip you want to try, you can get a commercial to go in there into the computation center and then try it out, right? So that's generally what we're doing with that. Um, so but actually, before I open for questions, um, if, if you're interested, I have a two-minute video if you want to see the inside of a computer. Um, it's two videos. So the first minute is going to be the one in the lab. So it's going to, you can see the inside of the computer, the inside of the dilution chamber, et cetera. Um, and you're going to hear noise. Like a shh, shh, shh. That's not the computer. Computer's silent. That noise you hear is that cooling system that's cooling the, the, the system down to 15 millikelvin. And the second computer, or the second video is on the IBM Q system where you can kind of see some of that advancements. So let me switch over. To that. Let me give it a play here. Oh, is that song? Is it not showing the video? Yeah. Oh, it's on, yeah, but the video is also on.
Did I hear you right that you have IBM? IBM the machine in New York, but what do they have in Zurich? The same machine. Similar to the one in New York? Yeah, the same. At, at IBM Zurich? Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you. A question from the audience. I will walk the microphone. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Why quantum computer from IBM not built like a tower? It built from like a chandelier. Why not build like a tower? What does the quantum connectivity and the number of qubits have to do with uh, quantum volume? I'm curious as to why it's associated with volume. Just wondering why it is associated with volume. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so right here, if I have good connectivity, but I have low coherence. I can only make so many operations before now I start making getting noise, right? So again, it, it goes into how much I can actually compute. Because if I need to compute 20 operations and I need to be able to, to entangle a lot of different bits or qubits, then I need to have both of those. And the more connectivity, the more coherence time, the more information, it means that the more capacity I can calculate. So that, 
box represents the capacity of uh, computations I can do, right? So that's why it's that's why it's it's part of um, quantum volume. Well, that's that's an easy e easy to say, but difficult to kind of represent. Mainly because one, there's various different reasons. Right here, it's a two-dimensional um, 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 piece, right? So it's a it's a plate. So all of these are on one platform. So to be able to, as you can see how pretty tight it is right now. So to be able to connect them all together, it's going to get very tricky to get these mechanical resonators to go in between all of these, right? So that's the first piece. The second one is, like I mentioned earlier, is if I send a pulse here and I want it to do something, then I'm just going to, I might get some leakage. So it's going to introduce some errors or some noise to the other qubits. So I want to be able to work on that as well. So I could connect everything, but I want to make sure that I do it in a way that doesn't make any difference. Even, even if there's, you know, these are listening at different frequencies, right? 5.25, 5.3 gigahertz, 5.35 gigahertz. But the resonators in between are tuned, but they're connected, right? So any, any one of those little pulses or operations I do is going to introduce some, might introduce some noise. That's why for the quantum volume, if you minimize all of those things, errors, pulse, and then that's why you have different errors for multi-qubit and a different error from gate error because of the fact that this is the kind of error now that I'm introducing because I'm sending up, if I want to send a pulse, from one to zero, meaning if one is uh, one, I flip the bit, I'm gonna send a pulse actually addressed to zero, but it's gonna determine whether or not this bit is a, a letting it go, and if it's triggered. And if it is, the pulse is gonna come here and then here. But if I'm doing something there, I don't wanna you know, introduce more noise anywhere else, right? So that's why you wanna make sure that you're keeping the low error rates in there. So hence, again, that, that builds a quantum computation because if I don't worry about errors, I don't worry about connectivity, I don't worry about decoherence time, I can do a lot more computations. Yes. So we use a uh, superconducting. We, we basically sense niobium and aluminum, in the sense that we build with all that. Yeah. And I have one, one more question. Sorry. Sure, sure. And um, there is is that required the um, machine languages to work with this? Uh, so there's an open source language called Quantum Assembly Language, right, COSM, Q-A-S-M. So our Qiskit is built on top of that, right? So our, our system works on both COSM and you can run Qiskit that's on top of that, so yeah. Yes? Hi. Uh, in order to construct three-dimensional structures of all these nodes mm -hmm. to get, you know, yeah. more entanglements, yes. would the pathway between nodes affect any you know, there is a time dimension. Well. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's one thing, right? Because the other idea would be, well, if I want to create more connections, make it multidimensional, right? 3, 3D, stack them and stuff, right? Or lattices, as it's called. So, so there are ways to do that. But yeah, you still have to think about the noise when you're going from one to the other, right? Because again, if, if it's free of air, which it, which it generally is when we put it in a dilution chamber, that's fine. But then when the pulses go through, we want to be sure we don't make any radiated emissions from there as well too, right? Even though the micro resonators are very high frequencies. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, I just curious, is, is there any potential to use a quantum machine uh, as network of it, like a learning short algorithm on a network of computer, quantum computing? So you mean using quantum for machine learning, or uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, network, quantum networks? Well, yeah, but right now we're, we're mostly focused on just the processing power, right, because there's other things like quantum teleportation and quantum communications. But right now our main focus is on the actual machine to be able to do the computation. So our first key is on computational power. Uh, with respect to quantum parallel workings, right, that's what we want to be able to do. Right? So when I, when I run an operation and I have 500 qubits, I want to be able to run all 500 qubits at once, right? So we have our pulses that will send those, all those pulses down at once at the same time, as opposed to one and then another and then another, right? So we try to work on that kind of parallel processing on the qubit. But we, not, we, want, to, we want to get this kind of increase the quantum volume here before we start thinking about expanding. That's why, for example, on the IBM Q System 1, that's a fourth generation 20 qubit processor. And the reason we went fourth generation is because we could have went from 20 to 50, but again, if I increase the qubits, okay, who cares? I, I got errors, right? But now the error rate between the, um, between the first generation 20 qubit machine and this one improves a lot, right? So, so once we got, so we, we wanted to focus more on the, on the error, or again, lowering the error, because if, remember from the chart on quantum volume, the lower the error, then we can look at quantum increase, because adding bits and stuff is also research we're doing, but our focus mostly is on the error rates, right? because obviously we want to make sure that we increase that as much as we can. Another question? Go 
So um, when you talk about you try to reduce the error rate, right? So how do you do it? Well, there's two different ways. So the, one of them is by mitigation by uh, software, and the other one is by the hardware itself, right? Because obviously when you're manufacturing it, when you're laying it out, the environment that it's in, et cetera. So there's a hardware perspective from it. On the software, it's by, in a sense, looking at models. If I know that my error rates are going to come at this time, and I, and I run certain operations, let's say an X gate or some kind of gates, I, can, I know the kind of noise that's going to in, get introduced at this particular point. So if I know that, I could write some kind of, I can adjust that um, unitary piece. So if I know, if I put it in Hadamar, which is 50-50, but I know that after I pass this, I'm going to, it's going to be maybe 40%, 60%, then I know that when I send this trigger, I'm going to send it a little bit more 40, 60, rather than 50, 50, because it's going to eventually time roll into that, right? So there's that kind of mitigation. So there's two different ways of, of doing it, software and hardware. So, so do you think one day we can use AI to help reduce the error? I'm sure, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they're doing that now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the research, I, 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 mean, I, I saw some papers. It's mostly, yeah, there's some papers we have yeah. now that's doing on error mitigation, and they're using just, because generally you're just generating a model, no. right? So if you recall on one of the slides that we have, in fact, we released it um, just recently here, so Ignis just came out, I think, about a month ago. And this one here is that tools for characterizing and mitigating error. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just that. If I, if I run something on a simulator, it's going to come up perfectly, 1100. Zero, zero. But for an actual machine, it's going to be 1100 zero, zero, and a little bit of one will be the other. So here you could do two things. If you want to you replicate an error in your simulator so you can work on things, you can. Uh, if you want to try implementing an error correction piece, you can run it on a simulator. I'm running on the actual machine and then see if it actually reduces the error. Right. So. Ignis was written specifically for that, is so that you can mitigate the error and also simulate and create your own error noises, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Another question? Okay, while you are thinking, I keep asking. Uh, <laughs> well, you talk about simulation and running the machine. Uh, what's the difference between the two? On the simulator? When you submit a job and, and you choose the option to simulate, yeah. what does it do? Yeah, so the simulator is just that. So in Kiskit Air is, in a sense, what we use to, com to send the information to either a, a simulator, which is just running on your classic computer, right? So it simulates the operations that are, because in, in quantum algorithms, it's generally matrix, you know, linear algebra, right? The next gate is just a one, a, a two by two matrix, and you're flipping your two basis states, right? So you can simulate that on a classic computer. But of course, once you start getting to large numbers, 20, 30 qubits, it gets a little bit more because obviously you're, you're growing your, your matrix by a very, very substantial amount. Um, so in the simulator, basically what it'll do is it'll simulate your operations. And the general reason for that is because if you want to be able to test your algorithm without any errors, you can run them on a simulator, right? That's what most people do now, right? And with the simulator, you can also um, run simulators locally on your computer. Right? But if you want to use one of the stronger ones, because we have it on the cloud, you can use the simulators that we have on the cloud, which are on build bigger computers, so they could compute much larger um, qubits. Right? So the simulators are in that, and this is all part of this um, um, Markiskit project. And with the same simulator, um, you can actually, again, plug it in with thickness and simulate noise. So if I want to see, I want to try to run this, and I put in the parameters for the particular noise on a machine, I can run the simulator and see what it will come out. So we're running on an actual machine, it just does that. It runs on an actual machine, and what you get back is what you get back, right? And generally, that's just so you can see, maybe if you want to compare, see, okay, am I getting back the same errors that I'm simulating here? If it is, and I can now say I successfully modeled, right, with, if you look at AI, I modeled this particular type of error for this operation or what have you. Other questions, please? You can ask in Thai. Yeah, you can ask in Thai, I'll get it translated. So, yeah. <laughs> or in Spanish. If you want. In Spanish, right. <laughs> then who is going to translate? Oh, no. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Robert on stage uh, to receive to receive a souvenir and take a good photo. Thank you. 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 Thank you.